Welcome to Inside Auto Podcast, where we feature everyone and anyone you'd want to talk to in and out of the automotive industry. Ilana Shabta here, host of Inside Auto Podcast, where we interview top dealers, GMs, marketers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders in and out of the automotive industry. And before we introduce today's guest, this episode is sponsored by Autoleadstar.com. The Autoleadstar platform is built on a technology so powerful, it allows you to market, sell, and service cars as you would in the real world at scale and online, making one-to-one matches between shoppers and inventory. Autoleadster is the only platform that is powered by scale, speed, and specificity to change the way dealers do marketing today. All right, we are back. I am so excited for today's guest, um, who I had the pleasure of speaking with quite a bit uh, recently. So we have today Tom Klein, who is the lead consultant and founder at Better, Better Vantage Point. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm great, Alana. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. And as I've told you before, I'm so excited for you to bring your content and bring your expertise. It's, it's going to be interesting today. It's stuff that we've never spoken about. Uh, really quick intro for you. Um, Tom has 30 years as a dealership owner experience and has worked in both, uh, with both public and private dealers to solve problems, keep customers happy, and stay out of court, which is really important. Uh, He is the endorsed expert for Dealer Marketing Magazine, uh, the Recreational Vehicle Dealer Association, the VIADA, and the CIADA as well. So lots of experience. So excited for you to be here. Um, Why don't we start with, and we're going to get into the good stuff, but why don't we start with how you got into automotive? I know you you did run a dealership. You You had some ownership in dealerships. So talk to us about that journey. Right. So my family, it's actually in my DNA, Alana. So my grandfather was in the car business starting in 1925. And he told me stories about taking the body and the chassis off the train and having the cars assembled right next to the railroad tracks. I'm not sure if that was fodder or he made that up or that's (laughs) the way it was, but that's what I was told. Uh, So he had a dealership starting, a Chevrolet dealership starting in 1925. And my father worked for him, and my father bought his dealership in 1964, and uh, and here I am after being in the business for 30 years. I love it. I love the the family business, um, especially in automotive. I think like it's so great to be ingrained in 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 the industry from very young. Um, But how did you make that switch from you know working in the dealership to creating this business? And and tell us a little bit about what what better vantage point does sure what we do is make sure that the money that the dealers make is the money they keep uh by important and very important thing for dealers you can sell 500 cars a month but if you're not keeping any of that money it's uh it's a rough way to go having all that exposure and all that money tied up in all those assets Uh, so what i do is uh through compliance through risk mitigation and through dispute resolution, we try to put policies and procedures in place, and when possible, lay off the risk to a third party uh, insurance company or establish some kinds of policies that will make sure that if a problem happens, that the dealer is not on the hook for that problem. And so how did you get into that? How did you make that shift? Well, at the dealership, uh, kind of the way I started, kind of the same way I started in the collection department, which was the collection manager got fired and I was anointed the next day as the collection manager Mm -hmm. when I had never done any collections before. So I had to figure it out. So over the last, I'd say 20 years, compliance has been kind of an evolving issue. I'd say uh, things stopped being the Wild West probably in the 90s sometime, in the early part of the 90s, and compliance became important. And so as it was becoming important for the dealership uh, as a family member, that's kind of uh, the role I assumed uh, and that I enjoy, and that I still enjoy today, in doing what I'm doing for dealers, what I did for so many years for the family dealership. Yeah, so tell us about that. What are some of the, the biggest violations you see or, or patterns that you see in, in dealerships that you think um, our listeners would appreciate just, just going home and checking on, on their businesses as well? Um, I'm sure you see a lot. 
So you could pick some of the biggest ones and share with us. Sure. Uh, the where I start with most dealers is what's going to be what what possible violations might hold them personally liable. And so I start with IRS 8300 compliance, and that's the cash reporting requirements to make sure that. Uh, all the employees are trained on that, that they've signed a acknowledgement form that they've been trained on it, that they're routinely trained on it, and that someone is going back and auditing at the dealership to make sure they're not missing some 8300s because failure to comply can lead uh, fines up to $5 million. Here's so that's one of the first items I bring up for a dealer. Really important. Because uh, if the IRS comes in and finds out that you're willfully non-compliant, it's going to be a bad day at the dealership. So yes. that's that's one of the first things I start with. This, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, that's a that's a big one. Uh, Five million dollars. Um, that's a that's a really really big risk for the dealership. What's what's some of the other ones? The second thing I usually ask is if they have a insurance pollution policy. Because with all of the oil tanks and all of the various pollutants that may get into the uh, water runoff or into the, you know, into the water system and go down the city drain and all that kind of thing, gotcha. dealers can be held personally liable for those contaminants getting into the water. And it's usually joint and several liability, which means that not only would the dealership as a company or a corporation be liable, but the dealer himself can be liable. So if you don't have an insurance policy, check on that right away. That would be the second thing that I would look at. Awesome. Um, wow. I, I feel like, especially since, you know, I'm in the, the tech and the digital, digital world with, with dealers, and so we never talk about this stuff, but um, I wonder if they just try to avoid most of these conversations, which I'm, I, I have a feeling that they do. So. Uh, good that you're bringing this up for sure. There's another aspect of your business that I saw that you work on as well that I think is important to bring up. And that can actually be a whole nother topic, um, a whole podcast episode, which is reputation management. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you help with that, what your stance is. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm really interested in knowing there are some dealers that are in it so deep almost, like they have basically... Uh, ignore reputation management for so long, how do they start? Because doing a 360 is going to be very difficult for dealers like that. So how do you advise? Yes. So just like any other problem with the dealership, because I'm a problem solver at dealerships. I mean, ultimately that's what I do. You start by just taking the first step, which is how are we going to do this? Let's put a policy or a procedure. Let's start, let's start with a clean sheet of paper, write down the first three or four things that we know about, and then we'll add to it as we learn and as we go along. But to answer your question, what I advocate the dealers do, there are 36 websites that they should check on a monthly basis, and about five or six or seven they should check on a daily basis. The obvious ones, Facebook and Google and Dealer Raider and some of those. Uh, one of my clients calls some of them the hater sites. Uh, <laughs> But it's actually true because I'm so much more inclined and this, I don't know what this says about me as a consumer, but I'm so much more inclined to leave a bad review if I'm angry than a good review if I'm happy. And, and that shouldn't, that really shouldn't be the case, but that, that is, that is our, my natural instinct. So I think, I think it's everybody's natural instinct. Uh, but the, the important thing is that you go on and you look for them first. The second thing is that you have to acknowledge how the customer feels. If they're angry, you label it. You say, I'm sorry we made you angry. We'd like to help you. Please call John Jones at the dealership. Don't just say, I, I, have, I came across another dealership that all their posts just say, please call this phone number, but with no contact information. Right. So even if a customer, and, and some of the, some of the uh, other, there are services that will just post a generic response, but that's obviously not what I advocate. Generic responses, right. when you're shopping for a car and you're looking through reviews and you're trying to see which dealers you're going to be interested in, you're going to read the dealership's responses and you're going to see if the responses are sincere or not. If they're insincere, it's a real turnoff for the customer. 
So the, the response has to be very personalized. It has to be very specific. We're sorry we upset you. We're sorry you're unhappy. Please call John Jones at the dealership at this phone number. And then the process that I advocate is once you've identified who it is, uh, which is pretty easy because, you know, you're going to come in and look at a uh, red Malibu and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're trading in their green Ford, you know, escape or whatever that it is. Right. And they're going to put all that on the, on the review. So all you have to do is call the desk manager and say, what's the name and the phone number of the customer who came in right. with you know, specifications. Then somebody at the dealership should reach out and call that customer, invite them in and sit down and listen to them and see what the, see what happened. Dealers can use this information to see where they're having problems in their operations. The customers are going to tell you where you're having problems. It, it may be a policy that you have, or it could be an employee who's a, a bad apple that you need to either counsel and correct and get them on the right path or, or replace. So you can, listening to these, these reviews are really important. So this isn't something that you should just designate to a low level person to fix the problems because generally the problems are complicated enough that somebody in upper management needs to do it. But even if you can't fix the problem, for example, let's say their credit is so bad that they, you can't get them approved. Or let's say that they're seven or $8,000 upside down and they don't have any cash down, right? So it's really, really tough to, to do anything for them. Bring them in, you listen to them, let them know that you appreciate the feedback, maybe give them a gift certificate for $25 for lunch out, have lunch out on us, but I really don't want you to be dissatisfied, we wanna make sure you're happy. And then after that whole process is done, once you've gained the trust of the customer again, and they understand that you are interested in them, then you can ask them to go update their review. And you say, I really take these things personally. It's really important to me that you're happy. This is my company. I've been here you know, so, so many years. Please go back out and let people know we're not such bad guys after all. I'm sorry we couldn't sell you a car. I'm sorry you know, you've had these credit challenges, and I understand how hard it is. But that's, you know, that's not really on us. And this makes us look bad in front of other people. So, and then if you're going through and you're reading reviews as a potential customer, you see that there was a problem, but that the dealer did something about it and that the customer was, they might not be happy, but they at least, it's at least neutral. And as a consumer, that's very reassuring because you know, if you have a problem with your purchase, you're going to be able to go back and, and, and do something about it. Right. You want to know that you're working with humans, which I think is part of what you're, what you're trying to train here. Um, I love that. I think that's really important. And I don't think uh, dealerships put enough emphasis on reputation management, even though there's, we talk about it all the time. Um, they don't go that deep into the process, right? It's just about checking boxes. It's less about how do we make this, uh, you know, a conversation um, how do we make this a process? How do we make this something that, that is embedded in our, our salespeople so that we can, you know, uh, avoid it in the future? So I really, I, I really appreciate that approach. I think that's a deeper approach than, than some of what I've seen in the industry. It's, I think it's really important, and I call it reputation mitigation, because it's really about mitigating the problem. Because if you're going to have a big problem at a dealership, it's going to start one of three ways, in my opinion. Problems come on two legs. So the first two-legged problem can be a customer. The second two-legged problem can be a disgruntled employee. And then the third problem is advertising uh, problems or discrepancies or bait and switch or vague advertising or just disappointing a customer who comes in. Yeah. That's how problems usually start. So if you can stop the problems before they start by satisfying those disgruntled customers by reviewing all these websites every month, you're going to go a long way into preventing lawsuits and regulators getting into your business and the attorney general writing you letters and all the politicians and the CFPB and the Federal Trade Commission. And if you're in a military area, the Armed Forces Disciplinary Control Board. I mean, the list is endless. 
Wow. Um, yeah, dealer, I'm, I'm glad and I hope dealers are listening to this so that they can uh, avoid all of these fines and, and save some money. Um, but uh, tell us about, I'd love to hear if you can think of one success story that really sticks out. Um, something, you know, maybe even a, a dealer that was very uh, um, against, let's say, or, or was very adamant about them having no issues whatsoever, and then you coming along and telling them a different story. I'd love to hear a little success story about that. I, I, I can imagine that happens quite a bit. It does. I guess I'll, I'll use myself on one of the success stories. One of the customers who had complained and when I was a dealership, we were horrible, horrible people badly and all that kind of thing. After I satisfied his concerns, I think he bought seven cars from me over the years that I was there. Wow. So if you treat people, as you said, if you treat people like humans and you really listen and you really try to fix their problems and you really try to help, they will be very grateful and, and never forget it. And the, the, this particular customer I'm thinking about, he never asked me about the price of the car. He just said, whatever you say is fair, is fair. And I was always 100% fair. We didn't, it wasn't a full MSRP deal. It was, it was completely fair. So if he went down the street and shopped the price, he'd see the price I gave him was fair. And I appreciated the loyalty. He used our service department all the time. So this is, and this is key. I mean, he was a customer for life. He really yeah. was just by my fixing his problem. And I couldn't even tell you what the problem was other than he felt like he didn't get treated properly in the beginning. Right. So I think that's a really good example of why working on your reputation online is important. That's so interesting because I, I talk about this with, um, with people at our company sometimes because you know we're a software company and, and there are going to be bugs and problems that we have with our customers and sometimes it's almost a good thing because it gives you an opportunity to prove that you have a team that can problem solve and that is there for you and so it's interesting because problems are inevitable so we have to it's all about how you actually uh, fix them and approach them and so this is a prime example of that you you know if you didn't have that little problem you might never have had a customer that bought seven cars from you and serviced their car from you that, you know, all those years. So a good lesson, a good takeaway. Um, it is. And as far as one of my clients, probably a good example is I had a client who really felt like he need me at all. He felt like his operation was smooth. And in the first 30 days of my relationship, I found five different insurance problems where he thought his agent had given him all the insurance that he needed in order to be, uh, to use his term, buttoned up um, to make sure that he was all in order. I found five different major problems and we were able to fix those very quickly. They're not complicated, but they just require attention. And sometimes I see things that either the dealer isn't asking about, perhaps he's not asking the right questions, or the insurance agent isn't aggressive enough in saying, hey, you're not listening to what I'm saying. You really need to consider these things. And it can be something as simple, Alana, as uh, making sure when you go rent a car, right? So the dealer goes on business trips all the time, and obviously he's going to go on vacation. So you go rent a car, and you don't check the boxes because you think you have insurance that's covered by the dealership, right? You're renting a car, and they say, do you need the collision waiver? You say, no, I don't need that. No, I don't need the liability. Well, have you ever really checked to see if you have uh, a drive other car policy or a hired non-owned policy so you're covered no matter what car you drive? These are really important distinctions on if you had an accident in the rental car and you didn't check the boxes and you thought you had insurance, you're not only going to have a problem with the, the cost of the car itself, which might not be a lot to a dealer, but certainly the liability aspects, you know, could be in the millions of dollars if it's a serious accident. Wow. Um, and, and that actually brings me to my last question here, which, um, you know, automotive is moving so much to digital, right? And we've been talking about this for years, but I think COVID especially really accelerated the dealer tech adoption. And, um, you know, there's some things that, uh, haven't fully gone digital, right? Like we haven't fully gone paperless, for example. Although I do see in the next couple of years, 
this just progressing more and more. How do you see um, that evolving your business and your business model, if at all, or has it already even affected it? A lot of dealers have, it's a great question, first of all. A lot of dealers uh, have, have, are paying monthly for a compliance management system. And they think because they bought the software that that's really all they need to do. And that's not all they need to do. There's a, there's, um, I'm the analog component, right? That's me. Um, there is a analog part of the business, which is, for example, are you documenting all these customers that you're satisfying? Are you somehow documenting that information? Because the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says that you have to have a compliance management system. And as a part of that compliance management system, you have to have a way to show the regulators that you are resolving these customer problems. So you may be resolving them, but if you're not documenting them somehow, then that's a mistake. I mean, I advocate the, the old three ring binder. It can be as simple as if you have a customer problem and you fix it, punch it, put it in the binder, and over time you'll have a chronological list of all the customers that you satisfy. Because if a regulator walks in and they say, well, how do I know you're taking care of your customers? Because Mrs. McGillicuddy says you do a terrible job. Then you pull out your binder and say, well, let's go through my binder. Now there's more sophisticated ways of doing it, obviously, but for 10 bucks, you can solve the problem. It's not, um, software can help, but you're always gonna have to have an interface for that software. Somebody's gonna have to go to make sure that your red flag report is written every year. I have a dealer who said, I'm all covered for red flags. I said, great, glad to hear it, let's look at it. And as we dove deeper and deeper and deeper, there's an, a requirement to write an annual report as to what tested the red flags and then what you did to mitigate the risk for those customers for identity theft. And he didn't have that report written even though he paid a lot, a lot of money every month for this compliance program. So. There's, there, is a, there is plenty of room for a good solution. I haven't personally seen one yet, but, but maybe there is. But I think you'll always have, uh, have a me as an analog component to move that along and make sure that it's, everything's being done the way it should. Yeah, and I think that's a really good mix. Um, you have, you know, whatever, the, 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 what's it called? Compliance management software? Is that? Compliance so management system. System. Okay. I'm, thank you. Right. Uh, compliance management system. And as long as you have someone that's actually managing that system, then you have a nice hybrid of, okay, there are technologies that support this, but you also need someone to be more goal oriented to make sure that the strategy is in place that, so that we're hitting all of these, you know, um, compliance requirements. Right. It's just like having a CRM with nobody right. managing the CRM. Exactly. It, exactly. And otherwise, it's going to be garbage in and garbage out. Exactly. You can't have a system or a software where you, it's just going to run when it really does require someone to input, output information in there. So that's, right. a, that's a good way for us to think about it. So I appreciate you making that, that clarifying that. Um, Tom, wow. Uh, this, like, I, like I started, this, uh, this podcast was really exciting to me because we always talk about digital marketing. Um, and I'm so happy that we're able to bring in a little bit of uh, different type of content and really important stuff for our dealers to hear. Um, so I appreciate all your expertise and your time. Uh, great getting to know you over the past couple of weeks. And thank you for coming on to Inside Auto Podcast. Any last uh, remarks for our listeners before we sign off? No, only if I, I'd say if anybody has any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn or through the website, bettervantagepoint.com. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Awesome. Yes. And thank you for, for letting us know how to find you. Um, and for those of you that did enjoy this episode, please tune in insideautopodcast.com. We will catch you next time. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Inside Auto Podcast. Check out our other episodes with top entrepreneurs and industry leaders.